when Jesus was there with the Sermon on the Mount, he told them to pray this way. And I'd ask you to join me, and we'll start off by saying the Lord's Prayer together this morning. And I have chosen a particular version. I learned it in King James, but I will do my best to... Uh, I have to read it, not to do the King James. So if you'd follow along with me. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today we're going to focus on, last week we focused on the first two lines, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Today I want to talk about the next line real quick. Let thy kingdom come. Let your kingdom come. See, I went right back to King James. There has always, though, been this obsession with the greatest military conquerors of all time. We studied one last time in Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar was one. Can you think of some? Caesar, Cyrus the Great we talked about, Julius Caesar, Genghis Khan, Charlemagne, Attila the Hun. Some of these people capture our imaginations. Like, how did they do this amazing thing? Some people say that maybe the greatest conqueror of all time, though, was Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great was... He was like 23 when he started, and he started off in Greece, and before you know it, he's conquered all the way down to Egypt, all the way to India. In just like a decade, he's conquered and basically taken over the entire known world. You know why he stopped? He, his men got tired. They wanted to go home. He never lost a single battle. That's an incredible thing to think about to go all the way from what would be Macedon in Greece all the way to India and down to Egypt and never lose a battle. That's, and that's almost, unheard, it was completely unheard of. So what is so great though is not just the way that, how the speed in which he conquered, it was that he left Greek culture behind wherever he went. You think about it, what, what is the Bible written in? It's not Aramaic. It's not Hebrew. It's not Latin. What is it? It's Greek. He, he's considered great, not just because of his military conquest, but because he spread Greek culture basically through the whole entire known world of that time. So how did he do this? This is really important to understand the way Jesus is talking and God's talking and the way we live in this contested world. So what they did is the army would go through and they would start conquering. The head army, Alexander, he was the point of the spear. He literally led his army at the front, which nobody does today. And that army would conquer an area and they would move on. But you can't just leave the area un unchecked because guess what's going to happen? A rebellion, something else is going to happen. So he had these special people who would come in afterward and he would have loyal people to Greece and they would come in and they would live in this contested area until, you know, for good. And they would start teaching the people Greek architecture, Greek education. They would start to, the word is Hellenize. It doesn't mean he Hellenize, Hellenistic comes from the Greek word for Greece. And Hellenize, you'll see that there's a Hellenistic, you'll hear that sometimes at church. It was a uh, maybe just this church because of me. But, but that, was the, that was the whole concept is they were going to make these people Greek. That was the, they wanted, because why? They thought that they had the best way. In fact, they, they were so certain of it that, and they were right about it, that people started really wanting to learn the Greek philosophers. That's why we know Plato and Aristotle and Socrates and all the other eases. That's an incredible feat that he did. And before time, man, these people were really, really Greek because they were so adamant that it was the greatest. But I would argue this. I would argue that Alexander's invasion was not the greatest invasion of antiquity. The Jews always expected 
God to bring his kingdom through an invasion to take over the whole world. That's what they were expecting. That's why the disciples were really excited when the Messiah comes along and they think they're going to go destroying Rome. But Jesus saw himself as this king, like King Alexander, ushering in God's invasion. Now, differently, right? We'll get to that. That is why, though, for so long, before Jesus ever died and rose again, when we talk about the good news, when we talk about the gospel, sometimes we start with Jesus died on the cross and and he was resurrected from the dead. That's the core of the good news. But Jesus was already saying, I've got the gospel, I've got the good news before death and resurrection. And people were excited. In other words, they had an expectation before that ever happened, before he ever showed them what kingdom was going to look like. You know what he said that got them excited? He went around preaching. This is in Mark, this is in Matthew, it's in the gospels. He went around preaching that the kingdom of God was at hand or near. That the ki- God's invasion from heaven to earth, like we talked about last week, was at hand. It was right there. But Jesus was going to be like unlike any other conqueror that the world had ever known. Because, put it this way, he couldn't be the prince of peace and defeat evil by taking part in it. He was going to be doing invasion a completely, utterly different way. Like I said, Christianity, last week I said, Christianity is not a a religion of escapism. Pray the prayer on earth as it is in heaven. He was bringing about an invasion of heaven onto earth, into our lives, into our communities, into our fellowships. He was conquering sin. He was conquering evil and We'll see what happens, right? But when you read the stories of Jesus, well, a lot of people just are like, they're really happy for Christmas, right? That Jesus is born again. And then la-di-da, there's something called Lent in the middle. And then you get to Easter and woo, another party. We really emphasize the beginning and the end. We don't really know what to do with it, except for maybe it's a little good morals, uh, some good teachings. Um, We're not really sure what to do with it. We love the miracles. They make us ooh and ah and wish they could happen to us if we just believe enough. That's kind of what people think it is. But there's so much more. What he's saying and doing is what Isaiah said would happen when kingdom comes. He's showing them. For one, for one, uh, Isaiah said there will be a release of the captives. All the captives will be let free. And so this is just one example. And so what does Jesus do? He goes sending out demons. He goes and he eats with people who should have been on the outside, who should have been captive. They were captive by their sin. And he's eating and celebrating and dining with them. And it doesn't make sense. He's communicating, I'm here to set the captives free. Well, there's many other things we could talk about. Isaiah talks about when God's coming, he's going to be like a shepherd. How many times does Jesus describe himself as a shepherd of lost sheep? He's communicating to them that he's the one. And that kingdom that Isaiah, that Jeremiah, that all of them have been talking about are coming in him. That's how he described his own mission. I think, again, the most misunderstood are miracles. People have a big misunderstanding of miracles. I, I know I did for a long time. We, we want them to have, we go, man, if, if Jesus loved me, I'd have a miracle too, or what am I not doing right to get a miracle? Or uh, we don't know what to do with them. They just think, whoa, he's a pretty special dude. Like he's super powerful. That's true. Here's what miracles are trying to relate to you. Miracles are heaven, God's reign, overlapping with ours so that he shows us a glimpse of his kingdom. He is walking around, and he is is where heaven and earth overlap. John calls him the temple. Temple is the place of heaven overlapping with earth. And when you engage with Jesus there, and he's walking around, you are getting a glimpse of heaven. You see tears going away. You see the lame walking. It's heaven invading earth in the person of Jesus Christ. 
So what you're, what you're supposed to see is not, ooh, I wish I could get some of that too, like the rest of the crowd who only want a miracle and walk away. What you're supposed to say is, kingdom's coming. The Messiah is here. He's the real deal. I'm going to follow him no matter what it costs me. That's what the miracles tell us. And John surely sees this. He, threw his, he, calls, he equates Jesus with the temple multiple times, like I said. This overlap of heaven and earth coming in a way during his life and death, coming in a way that foreshadows God's final and ultimate plan in Revelation when Jerusalem is coming down. He's foreshadowing the coming of the kingdom. First of all, you have to understand this prayer, this prayer, first of all, was a prayer for Jesus's victory at that time. That's the first thing. It'll be ours in a minute. But first, it's a prayer for Jesus's victory. First, when you think of Jesus's victory, when they disciples were thinking of Jesus's victory, they might have been thinking more like a victory in Megiddo, where we get the word Armageddon. They might have been thinking victory in the Rome, in the hills of Rome, maybe in some desert in Mesopotamia. But his disciples had even thought that Jesus lost the battle before any kind of invasion could begin. Do you see that? On the cross, they thought that Jesus had lost, that the invasion was not going to happen. Even though the whole time they were praying, kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, they were really praying for their idea of kingdom, their idea of will. But Jesus was praying the whole time, pray that it's God's will. Pray that it's God's kingdom that actually comes. Because Calvary looked like defeat to those whose minds are shaped by people like Caesar or Alexander. So they couldn't see victory. But he's actually declaring victory of the whole cosmos of God with his resurrection. His resurrection is saying, I have the victory, and I'm, it is invaded, and I've taken over death, I've taken over evil, this is my world, and you're not going to have it, Satan. And he sends out his disciples in Acts, and he, they go and they do some of these same miracles. Heaven's still moving, an invasion is happening through the church, through his people. Isn't that an amazing thing? That was the point of victory. That was the ultimate victory that says, okay, now it's our time to come and live like Alexander would send his people in after a big victory, and they would change the world to look more like Greece. We are heaven's citizens. And he says, go and live in the world and start influencing it to look more like heaven. You are heavenly people living in an earthly world. Live heavenly so that they may know the glory of his kingdom. Isn't that amazing? You're given that. Those disciples were given that. That's your charge. It's a fantastic, challenging way to look at this. I get this, but this is contested territory still, you see. We're living in contested territory, just like we talked about in Daniel. The good news that the kingdom of God has come and won is yours to share. It's yours to spread. It's yours to keep praying that his kingdom more fully comes to our communities, to our relationships, to our hearts. We're really tempted to take over like Alexander still. When our world feels like we're losing, when it feels like Christianity is losing ground culturally, our first instinct is kingdom come, like the way of the cross, or it's Alexander. Which one have you been picking and choosing? When you pray this prayer, you're saying, I want to do it like the king, my king did it. I want to replicate and live out this victory. Because to to join this invasion, the kingdom, his kingdom comes, means my kingdom falls. His kingdom come means my kingdom falls. Like it or not, 
most everyone now assumes that the most authentic and authoritative thing in your entire life is your inner voice, your own desires. Better yet, it, it is less and less about thinking than feeling. It's mostly about your feeling that directs people. I, I, I think we all fall for this, but I often ask people, what do you think about this topic? You know what they tell me? You know what the first words out of their mouth are? And I do this too. I feel X, Y, Z. I ask you what you think. And I do the same thing. But I, I want to say, I feel this way. Why do we say I feel? That's because for one thing, feeling has become ultimate in our society. No one can argue with your feelings, right? You just tell people, now feelings are important, but they're like the most authoritative thing in the world. If you tell me how you feel, I can't, there's no argument in the world, whether it's rational or irrational, that can, that can help with your feelings. We see it playing out in politics. We see it playing out in our culture. Now, again, they have, the, they have a right place in our lives, but they start to become our kingdom. My desires, my feelings, how it affects my inner self. See, the whole point of the Enlightenment thinker, starting all the way back in the 1700s, I've talked about it a few times, but the whole point of the Enlightenment was to put more distance between heaven and earth, between science and God's truth. It's a, part, it's a split that we didn't have to make, but that was the hope, to, to say, that's why you have deism, right? Remember, a lot of our founding fathers and different people in the Western world in the 1700s were deists. Yeah, there's a God, he's way up there and doesn't care. We're down here on earth. And before long, there is no up there anymore, and it's just us. The separation of heaven and earth has been the goal of the modern era. But what do we pray on earth as it is in heaven. We've got to rethink maybe how we think. You want to hear something weird? The bigger wedge that we have drawn and driven between heaven and earth, science and God, the less we have depended on rationality for our personal lives and the more on the superstition of our feelings the more that we've driven a wedge between heaven and earth for the sake of science, the more that we cannot discover truth. We don't know it. We're trying to figure things out. So nowadays in the postmodern world, we're living by our feelings. Isn't that ironic? You separate heaven and earth. Guess we thought we were saving rationality from heaven. Guess what's gone away? Rationality. It's an amazing thing to stop thinking about. If we bring heaven and earth back together in our prayer life, we must admit that we must submit to something outside of ourselves. We have to submit to something outside ourselves as more true than our feelings, than our thoughts, than our opinions. That there's something out there that maybe should humble us just a bit, not a lot. This is what it feels like to have your kingdom conquered. People disagreeing with who you are say who you are. You know, I'll put it this way. Accepting Jesus and his kingdom is not coming to some treaty of your kingdom and his kingdom. When you pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven and in my life, it's not some treaty that you're making with God in your own kingdom, with his kingdom and yours. I want that. I want to be like God. I have my part of life, how I want it to go. I know you've got some requirements. Let's figure this out, see how we can make my life better. That's the treaty view of accepting Jesus. But this is a prayer for true authority outside yourself to invade every aspect of your life, of our community, of our fellowships. You can't pray this prayer and think, but I'll do this as long as it makes me feel good. I think it's a, it's a, I'm going to try a God pill. Mm. Well, that didn't quite fill me up the way I wanted to. I'm going to go try something else. That's not faith. That's, that's an experiment. 
We know that it is to accept the destruction, right? We know from this from Paul. We have to accept the destruction of our old self to become new creatures. There's no treaty we make with God in this prayer. And it's a mental, social, physical change. He's invading everything that we are. It's not come and take a couple of my desires. It's come and take all of me. Come and transform everything about me. Yet what too many people miss here is that going to heaven is immortalizing their old selves. It's simply going, I want who I am right now to just last for eternity. It's what a lot of, when, we, when we're not very clear about Jesus being Lord, we kind of talk like that. I know we've all done it. I, I know I have. But to join God's takeover, you have to die to yourself. Take up your cross and follow him. Let your kingdom fall. Have you let your kingdom fall? And give it to God. Your pursuit of power, our pursuit of power, prestige, money, self-importance, hatred, And transfer, translate, ask, say, God, I want those things to go away. I want your glory, your kingdom to come and invade those things and destroy them. I want you to actually come and just destroy those things in my life. I want you to conquer those things in our community. It's not saying, okay, let's make a treaty. I'll keep this, you keep that. Can you ask God to say, come in and take away this thing in my life. I can't even have the power to hand it over to you. I can't change this desire in my heart that I, I want. I know it needs to change, but I can't change it. I, I hate this about myself. Can you pray this prayer? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, in my life as you have always planned it. Jesus says in Matthew 16, so later on in Matthew 24 through 27, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever, who, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Here's what you learn right there from, about kingdom come. It doesn't always feel very good. For some reason, we've psychologized the kingdom of God to the point that, look, if you just accept Jesus, you're going to feel great. Well, you'll get joy. You'll get some great things. But I tell you what, letting go of some of your kingdom hurts. It can really hurt to feel your kingdom falling. I was thinking about how painful it was to watch kingdoms fall. And now that it's the 21st century, we can watch kingdoms fall on TV like real ones. Uh, wars going on. I remember there's a couple that remind me of this uh, that have happened in the last, I guess, 20 years. Saddam Hussein and Gadd uh, Muammar, I can't remember to say, Gaddafi in Libya. Saddam, Saddam Hussein in Iraq. And man, they, look, they, they went down kind of the same way. It was a, a very strange thing. Uh, I remember Gaddafi, for instance, he, he was coming across as so superior. He was threatening anybody who might say anything about him. And these Libyans, in a, uh, not that far away, were starting a revolt, and they were doing some things that were he, making him so mad. And he's like, nobody can take over. I'm going to destroy you all. And one week, Tripoli fell. The capital city of Libya fell. And it became just a sad sight to watch for us. I mean, you see somebody so full of themselves. He couldn't believe it. He wouldn't believe it. So just like Saddam Hussein... He was in this tiny little bunker in the middle of the desert throwing out threats that he was going to destroy everybody. Just hiding in his little hole with the rest of the world changing and he wasn't going to believe it. I'm telling you this, the kingdom of God is coming. And you can hide in your holes all you want. We can hide our lives, but kingdom is coming. And you can push against it. You can pull against it. You can join the rest of the world in it. But when kingdom comes, fullness, where are you going to be found? Will your kingdom have already fallen and you have handed it over to Jesus? All our kingdoms fall like sandcastles along the shore when we pray 
kingdom come. To what kingdom do you really belong? Are you ambitious to build your life to match your natural desires and a voice to create the world in your own image? Or do you see the need to make your life and the world around you reflect Jesus and the cross? Is that your kingdom? Maybe you keep thinking that if you put a a little chapel in the middle of your kingdom where God can live, you'll be good to go. God doesn't want a corner shop in your kingdom. He offers you a home in his. Very important distinction. This only works with full submission. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The submission. We've made salvation about self-actualization many times, but it's not about that. It's about obedience and sacrifice. Accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is about obedience. It's about his love. It's about him being a part of what he's doing. And he needs a willingness to do whatever God asks, whether it feels good to do it or not. And you won't be able to do that if you're holding on to your own kingdom. This was Jesus's temptation, right? At the beginning of the story is he could do his will. He could have his kingdom. We talked about it Wednesday night. The devil says, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world if you'll just bow down and worship me. There's a temptation in our lives. There was a temptation in Jesus' life for that. But it's also at the end of Jesus' life. He must have been praying this prayer the entire time because when he's facing the cross, he comes to the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane, and you know what he says? Oh, Lord, please take this away from me. I don't want to do it this way. This wasn't going to feel good. This wasn't some kind of self-actualization. This wasn't some psychology feeling better. What did he say? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, basically. Right? Same prayer. That what does he say exactly? I'm having a Wednesday night moment. Thy will be done. I will do what you tell me to do. Not my will, but thine. All the same phrase. He lived by that prayer. And he got him to the cross. And it can get you through what you're going through, even if it doesn't end the way you want it to. Do you have the courage? It takes courage to pray this prayer. Real courage. Thy will be done. Again, it's a phrase of saying, I want God, King, God's kingdom to invade this world and give life to people, even if it costs me everything. That's what Jesus said. You must really believe, here's the thing. This is what it comes down to, I think, for me, most people. You have to really believe that redemption is possible for people. You have to really believe that people can change and transform by the power of God. There's no reason to pray this prayer if you don't think people can change. There was no reason for God to go, for Jesus to go to the cross if he didn't think the power of the Spirit of forgiveness of sins could transform your life. There's no sense in praying it, really, if you don't think that. People today still argue whether or not we are the uh, product of nature or nurture, right? People talk about nature versus nurture all the time. Are we a product of nature or nurture? For many people, you hear the reason they want to live how they live is because of their DNA. It determines who they are. For others, it's their environment around them. Excuse whatever thing they want to condone. I want you to stop and think about that for a minute. What hopelessness that you're just a product of some DNA strands and your whole life is determined about how your behavior is. All your life is determined by some DNA strands and the way the environment is around you. What hopelessness is that? To pray, thy will be done, could only be prayed at Gethsemane or today because Jesus believed the Spirit of God was pouring down and redeeming and transforming people. 
You are not just have to be the product of nature versus nurture. nurture. You can be the product of the Holy Spirit. You can be the product of what God can do in your life. That's an amazing good news message to so many people. You're not defined by those things. You don't have to be defined. I'm going to tell you what determines if you believe that people can change and redeem and whether people can actually change. It comes down to this, and especially as a church, but also as a person. Are we a fortress or a frontier-minded Christian or church? Does your mind think frontier or fortress? Fortress people have an us and them mentality. People can enter the fortress, and as long as they belong like us, and look like us, and sound like us, then they can come to church and feel comfortable, or feel accepted, or whatever. As long as they look and sound like us. This is this same mentality. Get your life... I hear people say that are not Christians, they have this mentality. I'll go to church as soon as I get my life right. No, right? We want to say no. But are we conveying that message? How can we change that message to people? Maybe we do it sometimes in Fortress Church just in Fortress Christians because we're comfortable. But we can really tell when this happens. Churches and Christians do this. When we begin on focusing on pleasing ourselves and our desires, and we go, man, you know what? We need to make sure the people who tithe are the ones who get, all the ben- who get most of the benefit. I've heard that a couple of times in my ministry. That's a fortress mentality. It says, you know what? We're here with people. Just come on. Just, we're here. Just come on. That's what you're counting on. That's fortress mentality. It confuses our calling. Oftentimes I see this. It's this kind of calling for holiness and separateness, saying, well, we're going to be separate from the community. We're going to look different. And that's great. We should do that. But it's, it's really mixed with indignation, apathy, and enmity with others. We kind of go kind of like a legalist, right? Like the Pharisees, they were kind of this fortress group where you had to be really, really good and everyone had to, and, but really it was about hating everything else, the way the world's going, whatever it happens to be. Fortress churches put down their crosses and take up permanent safe spaces. About talking tough, usually. You might even say they put down their crosses and they take up their golf clubs, for example, although I love golf. They want it to be a country club. It confuses our calling, again, for holiness with so many other things. Fortress churches don't want or need this prayer. They don't need the Lord's Prayer. Kingdom is coming, and we're just going to wait here until it gets here. Hope you come. Our part in the invasion of the kingdom of God, it makes you frontiersmen, not fortress people. You're a frontiers person. You're a person that God has said you're on the contested soil between God himself and Jesus and evil. And you're going to be living, as I said earlier, heavenly people living in an earthly world, influencing it, shining God's glory out to it. Frontiers women and men seem to always capture our imaginations, don't they? Have you ever seen frontier people? It's an amazing thing to think of the courage they have. The 20th century technology allowed us to see some of the frontier quests that have happened right in our living rooms. It was better than illustrated. I I said I was never better illustrated than in 1969. The world watched as two men stepped out onto the moon. A place that people thought was impossible to get to. People actually, there was for a very long time, people said that is an impossibility. Johnson Space Center opened up the old, what is it called, the uh, control center, the, where, they have, where you see in like Apollo 13, all the engineers and everything. They opened that up now that you can go there and you can sit in the, there's kind of these seats that were always back behind it, the original ones. You go and you sit back there and you listen and watch all the screens and hear the, uh, hear what they were saying, what everyone was saying, and you watch the whole thing unfold out in front of you. And it's this amazing, it's really an amazing uh, experience watching it all replay just like it did. But you can hear in their voices, they were nervous. 
and at the same time extremely professional. But that day made the impossible seem possible. They had to believe that they had to believe that it was possible to even step out on that rocket before anybody else did. Frontiersmen look out at a cold, dark, and evil world and say, I saw Jesus do it. I've seen the impossible. I've seen light enter into the darkness of somebody's life and change it. Frontiersmen see the potential for life and beauty in places of death and despair. Frontier Christians look at what others think is hopeless, and you know what we say? We pray, kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are heaven people. You are heaven people on the frontier of God's kingdom invasion in this world. There is a coming kingdom that will come someday in its fullness, and we are preparing the world for God's reign. And it is still beyond the horizon, and and we can't prove it, but we can tell people in faith that it's coming, and some of the fruits of heaven are already available in your life. That God's kingdom is coming toward them. It's an amazing message I want you to share. I think it was great to literally send the man to space who pretended from a studio for decades. He would say, boldly go where no one has gone before from a studio in California. But when given the chance, he put, Be- <laughs> he put Bezos' money where his mouth was. And he stepped into, he went into space as a 90-year-old man. William Shatner, amazing. Are we really frontiers people? Or are we just pretending from the comfort of our pews and pulpits? Are we really out there putting our money where our mouth is? Pray this prayer. This is your opportunity to step out and talk to a neighbor about Jesus. It's your moment to step out and talk to a coworker, to shine your light to get out of the studio, you might say, and really experience the kingdom of God invading your neighbors, your friends, your family's life. It doesn't matter if you're, if you're 10 or if you're 90. It's time. It's time.